Well, thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you just heard that the early part of my, part of my career was uh, in space of one sort or another, so I was a rocket scientist, and I've always felt that gives me license uh, to talk with authority on a whole range of subjects. So that's what I'm going to do this afternoon. Um, and the, the subject is communication, a uh, complicated and uh, highly polarized subject. And so I just thought I would start, uh, particularly because some might be feeling a little soporific after the effects of lunch, uh, with a journalist's approach. Um, you know, most of us uh, tell a story by starting at the beginning, having a middle and an end. But of course, journalists pack uh, the whole story into the first, uh, first paragraph and then just uh, paint in the detail uh, uh, in subsequent paragraphs so that late at night when another article comes in, the sub-editors can just take paragraphs off without having to worry. The story is still there right up to the last paragraph. So I thought I'd give you um, climate change in five words. So um, the first word is real. Uh, climate change is real. All of the evidence, uh, overwhelming evidence, that's been building up over 30 years of expectation and prediction demonstrates that we are seeing a massive change uh, to the climate of our uh, system. And you've seen some of the evidence in some of the other talks. <clears throat> So that's the first word. The second word is us. Um, of course, you know, the climate of the planet has been through many variations on many time scales for many reasons throughout its long four and a half billion year history. But this time, the evidence is that it is us. And the view of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that it is certainly half due to us and possibly all due to us, changes that we're seeing. So it's real, it's us. We're sure. And now, you, a lot of you will have heard about the 97% consensus. I'm always a bit nervous about the way that story is presented. Science is done by a sort of consensus, but not the kind of consensus that is implied by the 97%, as if we all kind of voted. The, the process is more subtle than that. But if you talk to climate scientists who have been in this game for a while and ask them, how sure are you? They will all say, I patrol this all the time, I do due diligence, I ask, me, ask myself questions, I wake up at night fretting about it, because if we were wrong, it would not just be embarrassing, it would be hugely damaging in all sorts of ways. You know, trillion dollar decisions are being based on our work, um, but we're sure, we are sure of what's going on. So, um, fourth word then is bad. Um, we had some discussions uh, yesterday, I was talking to Ian, and there will be winners. He was describing um, uh, uh, an Arctic resident who, who finds that gathering fish is easier now that the ice has retreated. There will be winners, um, but the majority of humanity will be losers, um, and there could be some very big losers, as again we'll, we'll see in a minute. So bad. And then the final word, the fifth word, is hope. Um, there is hope that the, the story of the, of the rate at which green technology, which is not the entire answer, but it's part of the answer, a big part of the answer, will give us breathing space, almost literally. The rate at which green technology is taking off on one of those exponentials um, gives us reason for great hope and, of course, the, uh, the Paris Accord and so on. So um, th those are the words. So real, us, sure, bad, hope climate change in five words, so we can all go home now, actually, but maybe not. No. Perhaps painted in a little bit more detail now. Um, so for me, um, as, a, as a physicist, um, and this goes back to the Anthropocene and the fact that we're interfering with the planetary system at the level of its metabolism rather than the landscape scale now, for me, um, uh, the, the key uh, fact is that we have upset the energy balance of the planet. You know, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's a thing the size of a planet, and we have upset its energy balance. Um, and we, we know that, uh, oh, and of course, the, the image that I've shown you here is an interesting one. It's taken in the thermal, it's a satellite image taken in the thermal infrared, and the key point is that you can't see the surface. So the greenhouse effect is demonstrated before your very eyes. The heat that's making its way up from us now to try and get back out into space and balance the energy that the planet is collecting or intercepting from the sun. 
struggles to get through the atmosphere because the atmosphere is opaque. And the reason that the atmosphere is opaque uh, in these wavelengths is because of the tiny concentrations of water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and a, and a few other uh, greenhouse gases. So you can't see the surface, and that's because the heat is having to make its way up by radiative transfer and convection until it gets to the level in the atmosphere where the remaining part of the atmosphere is so thin that it can finally escape to space, which is what the satellite is seeing. So there is uh, the sort of basis of how we've upset the planet in one handy diagram. Now, I'm going to show one piece of evidence which um, is beautifully displayed. This is, uh, some of you may have come across this before, but Ed Hawkins from um, University of Reading came up with this very nice way of displaying the temperature data, the global temperature data that we have for the last uh, 150 years or so on this nice um, clock face. So it's a clock face. We all understand what a clock face is, but instead of hours around the perimeter, you have the months of the year, so January, February, March, etc., around to December. In the middle, there's a, a white circle, which is the reference point, the, the reference temperature. So that is naught degrees relative. And that's the average temperature from about 1850 to about 1900 of the planet. And then the two other red circles are the 1.5 degree guardrail that was discussed to some of us rather surprisingly and encouragingly in Paris. And the two degree guardrail, which has been talked about for a long time now, which is the limit beyond which our interference with the climate system is deemed to become dangerous. Now, um, others argue that one and a half degrees is already dangerous. You know, there's a lot of discussion about that, but you're aware of these two guardrails. So what, what we'll see unfold is the story of temperature over that period. So here we are in the 19th century, not much going on, still around the white circle. As we move into the 20th century, things begin to happen a little. But it's when we get to the great acceleration that Owen was talking about last night in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, that we suddenly see some action. And then we reach uh, the last couple of years. Last year was the, the hottest year. You can see it became perilously close to the one and a half degree um, uh, guardrail uh, in February, March. Um, and this year, we're a tiny bit cooler because the El, uh, El Nino has faded away. But we are still well on our way to those guardrails. So I'll just let it run one more time. And there we are, the latest data point. So that's, to me, that's a fairly, although it's all to do with warming, that's a fairly chilling story that that graph shows. Because as the energy accumulates, we've seen the world warms, as we would expect. Ice and snow melt. I spent a lot of my career uh, studying the polar regions because they are, uh, you know, a canary uh, in the mine. If you've got ice, ice and snow close to melting point, you don't have to change the temperature much uh, to make a big difference. Um, sea levels are rising because the water is warming and expanding and also because ice on land is draining into it. Ocean and atmospheric circulations patterns change because the gradient of temperature between the equator and the poles changes because the poles are warming more quickly. Uh, extreme weather events increase, more energy is going into the system and it's swilling around between the different partitions in various ways. The water cycle accelerates, every degree centigrade uh, air can carry 7% more water vapor and we see that happening, we see more intense rain events as a result. Ecosystems respond, they're incredibly sensitive, particularly marine ecosystems, so we see them uh, shifting as a result of these changes. Food and water supplies are affected, people and species are impacted. And then the little twist in the tail, cascades of interactions are triggered, which begin to unfold with time constants, which are long compared with the forcing. So the forcing in this last 30, 40 years is uh, 100 to 1,000 times faster from the carbon dioxide change than anything that we've seen in the, in the natural uh, in ice age uh, interglacial cycles. And so the system has had a shock. It's the equivalent of an asteroid impact from the, uh, many of the elements of the system's point of view. And so we're watching a story unfold, um, which will have consequences that we uh, will find surprising. And indeed, if you like, the story of the last 30 years from the point of view of a climate scientist is that we haven't really seen anything totally unexpected happen yet, one or two surprising things. 
except the speed at which it has happened has been shocking. Um, even 20 years ago, uh, we were talking about the stability of the Antarctic ice sheet in terms that we wouldn't use now. We're seeing changes um, that have shocked uh, those experts who understood thought they understood the system. One of my glaciological colleagues from um, uh, the United States uh, retired recently, and he said his entire career has been punctuated by admitting uh, that things were going faster than he'd said, and things were going faster than he'd said last time. So that's been the story of his career. And of course, we were imperfectly adapted to the climate system that we inherited anyway. Uh, there have always been extremes which have been damaging, so ice storms, bringing down the Canadian grid, fires, droughts, floods, and so on. So we were imperfectly adapted to the system that we inherited, and we're certainly un uh, not well adapted to the, uh, the system that we're provoking. And somebody used the expression, I think Hugh used it this morning, that climate change is a threat multiplier. In a complicated and already rather unstable world, climate change makes things worse. So this image is, is really quite important. It's the last image of a little story uh, about the mass migration Europewards over the last few years. <clears throat> we know that the Syrian drought, remember, you know, Syria is in the Fertile Crescent, so this is where agriculture began and has persisted for thousands of years. The Syrian drought between 2007 and 2010 is estimated to be the one in 1,000 year event, and it displaced a million or a million and a half people from the land. Uh, they, their crops failed three years in succession. They moved to the suburbs of Damascus to join the two and a half million people displaced by the Iraqi war. We won't discuss that now. <coughs> uh, that led to civil unrest. It was handled badly. It led to the civil war, which added to the flow of migrants heading into Europe who were held at the boundary in Europe, which caused the instability in Europe, which arguably contributed to the fears of certain elements of us, our society towards strangers and foreigners uh, and to the, um, uh, the Brexit result and so on. So if you, if, if you tend to think that climate change is something that's going to happen in the future to other people uh, somewhere else in the world, you're ultimately, uh, you're completely wrong. It's happening now. We're feeling the effects uh, already. And of course, the US military and security services and others have identified climate change as the greatest threat multiplier within a complicated world for some years now. You heard that I chair the London Climate Change Partnership. Um, just consider the London floodplain. Uh, you can see the statistics here. Uh, one and a quarter million residents, 200 billion uh, pounds worth of property value, uh, 35 tube stations, 51 railway stations, and so on. The um, Environment Agency has produced an excellent plan, the Thames Estuary 2100 plan, to protect the floodplain uh, up until 2100, provided we spend initially one and a half billion, then another 1.8 billion, and ultimately probably about six or seven billion. But if you ask them a different question, if you say to the Environment Agency, what is, what is the largest sea level rise that you could protect London against uh, beyond which you give up? And they say, well, that's an interesting question. It's probably about five meters, because at five meters, even with a major barrage, we couldn't pump the river out fast enough to stop the river overtopping the raised embankments. So about five meters. And of course, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we would have said, well, that's a long time in the future. We're now looking at what's happening to the polar regions and saying, you know, that actually may not be too far away, 100 years, a couple of hundred years. And if so, maybe we shouldn't be protecting the London floodplain. Maybe you, because if we protect it, people will build on it. And, and that list of value and assets will increase. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you? That's why you're doing it. So if in the end you're going to have to let London go, and Amsterdam and Rotterdam and New York and, and uh, Florida, uh, as is pretty likely, um, you know, should we be spending that money that way? So it raises really interesting and fundamental and profound questions. So the good news, of course, is that uh, just at the end of 2015, the 195 nations of the world signed up to the Paris Accord. Um, uh, and of course, we know that the voluntary commitments that they made are not sufficient uh, to keep within those one and a half degree or two degree guardrails. 
But just in the same way that the Montreal Protocol, when signed, finally shifted the conversation from should we, if we were to, do you think we should, to now that we've agreed we're going to do this, we know that our commitments aren't enough, but how are we going to crank them up on a yearly basis to meet needs? We've shifted through a very important transition from 20 years of discussion about should we or how to now that we've agreed to do it, what can we do to make sure that we really fulfill those goals? So I'm optimistic about that process. But it is, uh, does uh, commit humanity to the greatest collective action in history. So governments, business, and of course, governments set the ground rules, but business will deliver the world that you and I um, consume, because we will in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time. So business are crucial. Um, and people. So this collaboration between governments, business and people has to work in a coordinated way to deliver a result that keeps us below those guardrails or as uh, close to them as we possibly can. And so successful policy implementation, obviously you need to target, as we heard in the uh, talk um, uh, by Megan yesterday, you need to target the people who have got their hands on the levers of power. But that won't get you to the result you need if you don't have public permissions, if you don't have uh, the tolerance of publics. And here are protesters protesting against a carbon capture and storage um, project um, because of fears about the um, possibility of a leak of liquid carbon dioxide, which could then suffocate uh, a community which uh, might be exposed to it. So without bringing people on board to have a uh, co-produced solution, you run into trouble. Um, and we also heard that we have a finite uh, a pool of worry. Um, and so uh, the UN has this My World uh, poll where citizens from 45 nations, nearly 10 million of them, have voted now on 16 issues that they uh, are concerned should be addressed in society. So the, the top uh, concern is a good education for my children, better health care is second, better job opportunities. If you work your way down the list, you find action taken on climate change is there. Yes, we'd like action taken on climate change, but it's number 16 on the list. Whereas many of us who understand what climate change um, uh, is, is going to deliver feel that it really should be much higher up that list. So what's going on here? Um, if I were to give you um, a talk on uh, the, the Big Bang or cosmology, or in this case the Higgs boson, uh, depending on how I delivered it, I could engage your natural curiosity, um, entertain you, inform you, uh, educate you for an hour. And at the end of the hour, as you walk out of the auditorium, you would be unchanged as people, other than maybe being a little bit more interested in, in particle physics. Um, but climate change falls into a group of, uh, of scientific topics or to topics addressed by science um, which are different, uh, uh, whether we're talking about GM crops or vaccination or um, other similar issues. Climate change, uh, either unconsciously or consciously, um, as the story is told, raises an emotional reaction. So you could feel it with Hughes' uh, uh, expose of just how serious the climate change problem is and ask yourself whether you recognized it or not. You know, how did you feel at the end of that presentation? Almost certainly uh, anxious, uh, concerned, afraid, feeling of loss, grief, and in particular helplessness, which is the, the most damaging. It just shuts the audience down. And so um, inadvertently, and Mayor Cooper, those of us who have delivered this story, uh, the irony is that the better we have delivered just the climate state change story, the more likely it is that we have charged up cognitive dissonance, a feeling of discomfort in our audiences, um, which is a dangerous thing to do, particularly because all of us have deep-rooted values. We react in ways that we uh, find difficult to even analyze ourselves uh, to experience. Um, and if we just take the United States, where I've uh, drawn a, a kind of democratic, a democratic head, which unusually in the world of politics is blue in the States, just to confuse things, uh, and a Republican one in red, the values that are associated with people who vote in those ways are, for the Democrats, communalism, and not communism, but a communalism, interesting, interest in community, reducing harm, protection, stewardship of the planet, and so on. 
whereas there is a tendency amongst Republicans to value individualism, personal freedom, uh, reject state interference uh, or, or government interference, and uh, have a, a regulation is an anathema. So the story of climate change, again, either unconsciously or consciously, challenges very deeply held values, beliefs, and issues of identity. And if you think these aren't important, just ask yourself, whichever side you were on, how you felt on June the 24th last year. Uh, very, very deeply uh, shaken identities, people saying, I no longer understand or know or like my country, um, as a result of a decision, a simple decision. So these values run very deep. And it means that in general, some people see climate change as a threat which needs to be managed. You can't solve it, but you can manage it, you can address it. And others dismiss it as a hoax because they're trying to find a way to overcome the cognitive dissonance and they're looking for narratives which allow that to happen. And unfortunately, because we climate scientists have charged up a huge amount of cognitive dissonance, either based on emotions or values, those audiences have been prone to the headlines in certain newspapers that say it's natural variability, so my real, they say it's unreal, or um, it's not us, it's the sun, or we're not sure, there's doubt, uh, or um, we can't afford to do anything about it, so there is uh, no hope. So we're much less rational than we think because we all uh, respond to experience in these ways. Um, academics, we all like to think we have the Mark II brain, but I've been working with neuroscientists and others over the last few years, and I've come to realize that we are all equipped with the Mark I brain, I'm sorry. Um, and so we're all um, susceptible um, to what uh, Daniel Kahneman called jumping to conclusions. Are, are the human mind, I'm sorry that the slides are for some reason just a little bit off the bottom of the screen here, but the human mind is a wonderful machine for jumping to conclusions. Most of the time, the rational part of our brain sits quiescent. It only um, uh, becomes engaged to remove dissonance or if we have time to consider stuff. But most of the time, we're highly reactive and uh, that uh, uh, type one uh, thinking is just based on a sudden massive sort of kachunk of uh, neurons in our head that go, uh, we don't like this, we do like this, we approve of it or whatever. So we're machines for jumping to conclusions. So given that, how do we, how do we connect those uh, lumps of gray matter that are encased in this skull with the ones that are in your skulls simply by way of senses and um, little waves that go through the atmosphere. The way that we academics talk to each other is through the information deficit mode, and that's largely what I'm doing at present. We deliver each other facts, and with other experts, that's a very effective way of exchanging information, knowledge, and developing new ideas. But with people who aren't experts, it's not a very effective way, and, and there have been countless studies that show that scientists simply giving people facts does not engage them and does not change the way they think. In fact, it usually uh, makes them cross. Um, I had experiences where, in, in the States in particular, where somebody who looked like my mother suddenly launched herself in the audience and started screaming at me that how dare I um, tell her that she couldn't leave every light bulb on in her 27-room house because she was an American and she had a God-given right to use as much electricity as she liked. And you're sort of standing there a bit bemused, saying, well, I'm just telling you what we know. I'm sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> so the information deficit mode doesn't work. But storytelling has been around for the uh, duration of the human race. We are storytellers. And the more you get into the psychology of this, the more you understand there are the reasons for it. And so I'm going to show you a little clip from a three, three and a half minute um, video that was produced just after uh, World War II. So just watch this little bit of action. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop it there. So this is a little extract from a, a longer piece. And just remind yourself, you're looking at a large triangle, a medium-sized triangle, a small dot, and four lines. And you watch them move in a way, this is by a couple of psychologists called Hydra and Simmel. They, they did this movie and they published the uh, result in 1944. And if you watch this thing, you see agency. When, when the uh, piece at the top right of the rectangle opened, you didn't see it push the triangle to one side. You saw the triangle open the door. 
um, you saw some action, some interaction between the triangles and the, and the uh, circle. And if you watch this, you cannot help but uh, assign to them intentions and motivations. You see emotions, uh, the way they move. Um, and you see character traits. And once you have seen the movie once, the animation once, you cannot watch it again without having that story, that narrative reinforced. And what this seems to be telling us is that the way that we assemble complex experiences, things that go on around us, is to place them into a narrative structure. And indeed, if pieces are missing, we will fit something in so that it becomes logically coherent and consistent. That is the way we make sense of the world around us. Um, and yesterday you heard um, uh, Megan, I think it was, talk about the hero's journey. Here's a different version of that. Every story, the hero's journey in particular, can be broken down into six uh, uh, characteristics and three axes. So every story is about the hero, the subject, seeking to acquire something, a success or something material or whatever. So the basic axis of every story is the story of desire. Uh, some action that moves from not having something to having something, an achievement, acquired something, or whatever. So the axis of desire is the core, but it's very boring if the subject just goes and, and gets what it is. The boy gets the girl, the, you know, the person gets the apple, or whatever. That's not very interesting. So to give the story some cultural complexities and some interest, the uh, key axis is the axis of alliance, where you have um, opponents and helpers, you have problems to overcome, um, and people to help you do it. So imagine it, all of the James Bond uh, films, how many of them are there? I know 15 of them now. Bond is given an objective, save the world. Uh, Schmirsch is attempting to prevent him doing it, or people are flinging bowler hats with steel rims at him to prevent him from achieving his goal, and the girl helps him, and, uh, and that's the story. Except that he is licensed to kill. So he doesn't just make this up on his own. M calls him into her office and gives him an assignment. And it seems that in any story, for it to feel acceptable to us, we need a framework of the real world in it where a sender authorizes the action, and at the end of it, the world benefits, humanity benefits. But there is a deeper and more profound framework in which, in which this action plays out. And of course, for it to be interesting, there has to be a narrative arc where the tension builds up. Maybe there are a couple of wobbles in it. Um, but there is a climax and then a resolution. All stories have um, those basic structures. And they are memorable, particularly if they are experiential. If it's not just a story that you, you uh, read with your eyes or hear with your ears, but something that you touch. Why is it that we still buy books when we could just read stuff on our on our uh, Kindles or whatever. It's because a book has texture, smell, color. Um, we, th that is the minimum experience. When you're talking about changing polar regions, if you can hold a piece of ice, which is twice the age of the human race, this is an experience that you don't forget. So on this basis, and uh, I've been working in interdisciplinary science and multidisciplinary science for a long time. And I've come to realize that in the end, there are experts. Whatever Mr. Gove says, there are experts out there. And there's no point in trying to replicate their expertise. You could spend your entire life doing it. So a couple of years ago, I had the, uh, the pleasure to work with Katie Mitchell, the theater director, Duncan McMillan, the playwright, and myself. And between us, the three of us brought our uh, skills, knowledge, and understanding together and we assembled uh, the play 2071. The reason it's called 2071 is that in 2071, my eldest granddaughter will be the age that I was when we wrote the play. So that gives us a link, uh, a human link into the future that other people understand. And then the play is me off duty saying, you know, if you, you know, if you want to come along and hear what I think about this subject, you know, if you want the formal science talk, I can give you that. But if you just want to come along and hear what I think, my opinion, my views, and where I think it's going, and why I believe what I believe, then you know, pay the money and come along. It was hilarious. There's one point in the play where to strengthen my own opinions, I essentially recite part of the IPCC Working Group 1 uh, AR5 report. And I'm you can't see the audience, but you're thinking, God, they're paying money to listen to me recite the IPCC report. This is really funny. Anyway, 
So the play was a big success. Michael Billington gave it a five star. It sold out. We did two runs in the Royal Court. We did a run in, um, in Hamburg, and I did a, a, a big performance in Brussels. And so I'm just going to read you the tail end of it, because I want to show you the difference between the way I would normally write something on, on climate science and um, what we ended up doing by working with Duncan and the others. And I can give you plenty of anecdotes about how much I learned from working with those two brilliant people. So very quickly. We're all dependent on energy. <clears throat> Almost everything we do depends upon it. There will be carbon, at carbon atoms generated by this event, uh, by the lights, by the amplification of my voice, by the train ride down here, uh, that will be in the air in 2071, in the air that my granddaughter, Josie, will breathe. That and all of our other carbon dioxide emissions are our legacy. Science cannot say what is right and what is wrong. Science can inform, but it cannot arbitrate, it cannot decide. Science can say that if we burn another half trillion tons of carbon, which is what we've done so far, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere will increase by another 100 parts per million, and that will almost certainly lead to a warming of the planet greater than 2 degrees centigrade, resulting in major disruption of the climate system and huge risks for the natural world and human well-being. But science cannot answer moral questions, value questions. Do we care about the world's poor? Do we care about future generations? Do we see the environment as part of the economy, or the economy as part of the environment? The whole point about climate change is that despite having been revealed by science, it's not an issue about science. It's an issue about what sort of a world we want to live in, what kind of a future do we want to create. Now, I would normally finish there, letting people just reflect on that. But ending on a rhetorical question um, is a bit indulgent. It's important, because it, it does ask a hugely important question. You ask yourself, you know, when you go, because one damn thing is sure, every single one of us in this room will die, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, it just, you know, having consumed a bunch of stuff, or would you like to think that even if people didn't know, that you had left your mark uh, on a better future. So I just want to add a couple of thoughts, one of which um, I've had for a while, and another of which was really triggered by uh, a couple of the talks yesterday. So firstly, when I was director of the Science Museum, I was allowed to prod around in the reserve collection down at the Roughton Airfield, where 96% of the uh, collection is held. And it's an extraordinary experience when you look at the technological and engineering and scientific ingenuity of that tiny fraction of society who invent things and make things, uh, what you might call the useful part of society, um, uh, you come to the conclusion quite quickly that human in on, on an otherwise finite planet, uh, with all sorts of uh, limitations and restrictions, human ingenuity is genuinely unbounded. And that's a very, very thrilling conclusion to come to. It's an exhilarating conclusion to come to. It's, it, it, it drives a great deal of optimism. And certainly, this, this book and this play um, place great emphasis on the green technology revolution, which will certainly give us a breathing space and certainly make a great contribution, but it, it won't be sufficient. So human ingenuity is unbounded. That's good news. But as we've heard time and time again, Failure of imagination is unbounded too. I, didn't, I, I actually put the word stupidity when I wrote this this morning, but I thought it's probably um, a bit too strong. But, but haven't we, we just heard about urban planning? I mean, for Christ's sake, couldn't we do better? Uh, you know, the Grenfell Tower result. You, you could predict that that was going to happen. If you throw out three regulations for every one that you put in, uh, and if you ignore the words of experts, in the end, that is the sort of thing that will happen. Um, I just used the, uh, the picture of the Fukushima uh, uh, nuclear plant exploding, the hydrogen explosion, which, interesting, I saw in the HSBC bank in Guildford. They had a screen on, and I was just getting some cash out, and I saw that go off, and I said to my wife, shit, that's not good. Uh, and, and why was that? If you read the book Fukushima, it, was a fa it wasn't actually a failure of imagination on the part of the scenario planners. They thought all these things through. It was a failure of imagination of the regulators, the, uh, the PEPCO, the Japanese government, the nuclear industry in general, to ensure that they covered every single 
base. So not only uh, are we brilliant at uh, thinking up things, but we also seem to be um, uh, shackled by a lack of ability to see through and deal with these complex problems. So I was very taken with uh, Owen Gaffney's um, uh, presentation yesterday, and it does seem to me that whatever the technological solutions we put forward, in the end, the emergence of something he called planetary intelligence, but a little bit more wisdom and sensibility about the way we organize ourselves in this complex world, is in the end going to be pivotal. Whether it's uh, nuclear weapons, whether it's contagious diseases, whether it's uh, damaging the climate system, in the end, we have got to find a way of better organizing ourselves. And we, we talked about future Earth um, and, and the way the science community and academia is focusing on painting in more detail here and there. To me, this is the big issue. We have got to address this one. We have got to figure out how to organize ourselves in a more effective way, because in the end, we're going to trip over ourselves in a very upsetting way uh, if we don't really tackle that. So I've got a few more years left in academia, and I can tell you this is what I'm going to be focusing my attention on. So thank you very much. <laughs>